Hello again, and we're back with more of Book 2 of Protector of the Small, Page, and tonight is Chapter 3. Brawl. The next morning, Kel rose before dawn as always. It was not easy. She felt stiff, old, and battered. When she stubbed her toe, she remembered that she could only see through one eye. At least the blackened eye no longer ached so much. I could have had ice, Kel thought bitterly, but no, I had to be tough. I was mad when I chose this life, she decided as she unlocked her large shutters. I was stark, raving mad, and my family was too polite to mention it. That's what living with the Amanis does to people. They get so well-mannered, they won't mention you're crazy. She opened the shutters wide. Outside lay a small stone flag courtyard with a slender, miserable tree at the center. The flock of sparrows perched on its branches, headed for Kel, swirling around her in a rustle of feathers and a chorus of peeps. Except during winter, they preferred to sleep outside and join her for seed and water in the short gray time before sunrise. While most of the birds went straight to the dishes, a few landed on her shoulders and arms. Kel gently stroked their heads and breasts with a finger. She had nearly thirty after the spring nesting. Brown and tan females and males, the males also sporting black collars, they appeared to see Kel as a source of food and entertainment. They chattered to her constantly, as if they hoped that with enough repetition this great slow creature would understand them. She was admiring the male whose pale spotted head had earned him the name Freckle when something large and white vaulted the window sill on her blind side. It landed beside her with a thump as the sparrows took to the air. She backed up to look at it properly. The dog, Jump, grinned cheerfully at her, tongue lolling. His crooked tail whipped the air briskly. Absolutely not, Kel said firmly. She pointed to the window. You live with Dane now. Dane! Jump stood on his hind legs and thrust his heavy nose into Kel's hand. How did you know to come in here? Kel leaned out the window. If she hadn't been so vexed, she would have been impressed. It was four feet from the ground to her sill. She turned to glare at the dog. Back to Dane, this instant, she ordered. Out! Out? A quivering voice inquired. Lalassa stood at the dressing room door. What did I... Kel pointed to Jump. Oh, the dog has returned. Lalassa pattered out into the main room and poked up the hearth fire, then put a full pot of water over it. My lady should have roused me. I did not mean to lay abed after my lady was up. I wake before dawn, Kel said, going to the corner where she had left her practice glaive. I practice before I dress. She gave the weapon an exper experimental swing, making sure there was plenty of clear space in this part of her room. She didn't want to break anything as she exercised. At least she had gotten some real glaive practice over the summer. While her sisters Adelia and Orain, young eastern ladies now, had lost the skills they learned in the Imani Islands, their mother had trounced Kel every day for a month before Kel's old ability had returned. Kel often thought that Elaine of Mindelin could give even the Shang warriors who taught the pages a real fight with a glaive. Kel swept the weapon down and held it poised for the cat, so for the cut named the broom sweeps clean. Her grip was not quite right. She adjusted it and looked up, ready to begin the pattern of movements and strikes that were her practice routine. Lalassa stood against the wall beside the hearth. Her hands, covered by the large quilted mitts used to lift hot things off the fire, were pressed tight over her mouth. Her eyes were huge. Now what, Kel wanted to say. She wasn't used to explaining her every move to someone. Instead of scolding, she bit her tongue and made herself think of a lake, quiet and serene on a summer's day. When she had herself under control, she asked, What's the matter, Lalassa? I... I want to be out of your way, my lady, is all. It's so big. Do you always swing it like that? Kel looked at her weapon, confused. It's just a practice glaive, a five-foot-long wooden staff with a lead core capped by a curved, heavy, dull blade, 18 inches long. That's what it's for, see? You, you can wield it like a, like a long-handled axe. She brought the glaive up overhand and chopped down. Or you can thrust with it. Kel shifted her hands on the staff and lunged. Or you can cut up with the curved edge. She swung the weapon back to the broom sweeps clean position and stopped. 
The lasso was plainly more frightened than ever. You could learn to use it, offered Kel, to protect yourself. The Yamani ladies all know how to wield the glaive. Alassa shook her head vigorously. Grabbing the pot of hot water, she scuttled into the dressing room with it. I wish she wasn't so nervous, Kel thought, clearing her heart for the pattern dance. I hope she gets over it. She put Alassa from her mind and took her opening position. Step and lunge. Her stiff body protested. She was panting by the time she was done. Next, she forced herself through 20 of the floor press-ups that Ida Bell, the Shang Wildcat, had said would strengthen her arms. As she finished, the great bell that summoned all but the deafest nobles for the, from their beds rang. It was the beginning of another palace day. Kel walked into the dressing room. Hot water steamed in her basin. Soap, drying cloth, brush, comb, and tooth cleaner were all laid out neatly beside it. Even in here, Lalassa had made things more comfortable. A tall wooden screen hid her bed and the small box that held her belongings. She'd found a scarlet rug somewhere, a brazier for heat when it turned cold, and a cloth hanging to cover the privy, the privy door. Kel's morning clothes, shirt, canvas breeches, stockings, boots, a canvas jacket, were draped neatly over a stand that Kel had always thought was a hurdle put in her room by mistake. Lalassa, she said when she was dressed, would you like to learn ways to make people let go? Holds and twists to free your arms, grips that will make them think twice about bothering you. I know some, and Lalassa shook her head so hard that Kel wondered if her brain might rattle. Please, no, my lady, she said in a tidy, scared voice. It'll be different now, with my having a proper mistress. That's what Uncle said. The nobles don't mess with each other's servants. And I'll be careful. I'll be no trouble to you, my lady. You'll see. Hey, Mindelin, someone yelled in the outside hall. Come on! Kel sighed and looked at Jump. He had watched her get ready, his tiny eyes intent. After breakfast, will you take him to Dane, she asked. She's on the floor above the classrooms with. Lalassa was shaking her head again. My lady, she'll turn me into something. She's uncanny, forever talking to animals and covered with the mess they make. Kel was a patient girl, but there was something to Lalassa's meekness that set her teeth on edge. That's silly, she snapped. Lalassa stared at the floor. And here I frightened her again, thought Kel. Now her head ached as much as the rest of her. Look, will Gower do it, if you ask him? Take Jump to Dane? The lassa nodded. Yes, my lady. Then please ask him, too. Kel left before she could say anything else. The lassa just needs to get used to me, she told herself, as she joined the boys headed for the mess hall. She just needs to learn I won't be mean to her. Then she won't be so, so mousish. Please, goddess. Neil's first block of Kel's fist punch felt every bit as soft and weary as her blow. They both made faces. What's the matter, second years? Tired? Kel had always thought that Hakun Seastone, the Shang horse, was improperly cheerful for Yamani. Now he circled her and Neil, grinning. He was tall for an islander, with plump lips and dark, almond-shaped eyes framed with laugh lines. His glossy black hair was cropped short on the sides and long on top, so a hank of it always lay against his broad forehead like a comma. He wore plain practice clothes and went barefoot. Add two pounds of weight to your chests, and you act like you carry the world. Put strength into your blocks. I want those punches to mean something. What if you're unhorsed and fighting in mail or plate armor? You'll wish you'd listen to the old Hakim then. Ready, begin. High punch, high block, middle punch, middle block. Low punch, low block. His teaching partner, the Shang Wildcat, peered into Owen's face. She was an older woman, her skin lightly tanned from summer, her close-cropped curls. Sorry. Her close-cropped curls, silvery white. What are you looking at the seniors for, she asked Owen, pale eyes glinting. You don't get to look around till you punch like a fighter. Not a cook needing bread. Kel tried to will more vigor into aching muscles. At breakfast, Phaleron and Rold had said that everyone was exhausted when they first donned the harness, or when new weights were added, but Kel didn't remember if she had noticed the older pages struggling last year. I hear the third day's worse, Neil moaned as the bell rang. It was their signal. 
was their signal to lurch to the yard where Lord Wilden and Sergeant Ezeko drilled them on staff combat. I just want to live through today, said Merrick as they filed down the hall. The fourth years, walking behind them, pushed by the younger pages to take the lead. They did it roughly, yelling, Oldsters first! Passing Kel, Joran thrust his elbow back, clipping her black eye. Kel gasped and bent over, covering her throbbing eye. A cool hand rested on hers, and something flowed through her fingers. The pain vanished. Kel took her hand away and glared at Neil. It still looks nice and puffy and colorful. His voice was dry, his green eyes worried. Kel, we have to do something about him. Yes, she replied. Stay out of his way. Joran's a page for just one more year, and that's what I mean to do. She's right. The prince stopped beside him. If she takes revenge, she's the one who will look bad. So there, Kel told Neil, and marched on down to the next practice court. Beneath her calm exterior, she wished fiercely that she could pound the meanness out of Joran. Even as she thought it, she knew she would do better to ignore him. Water, she thought collecting her staff from the shed where it was kept. I am a summer lake on a windless day, cool, clear, and still. Joran is a cloud. All he can do is cast a shadow on my surface. I'll be here long after he's gone. She concentrated on that thought fiercely until Lord Wilden and the sergeant barked orders for the first series of exercises. The yard rang with the clack of wood striking wood and yelps from those pages whose fingers got hit. Cal listened to the noise and let it fill her. It worked better than thoughts of a clear lake to clear her head. At least she was less stiff after their time with the two shangs. Settled into the rhythm of the first exercise, she looked for the training master. Lord Wilden watched them from the fence. Keeping his eyes on them, he crouched to scratch the ear of an old, ugly white dog with black spots. Cal's attention wavered. Phaleron smacked her collarbone with his staff. The force of the blow drove her to her knees as pain shot like lightning through her right side. Kel, you didn't block it, cried Phaleron appalled. Neil, back in Lige, Page Neelan, as he ordered as he came over. If there's a break, she'll see a proper healer. He knelt beside Kel and felt her collarbone, his fingers gentler than his face. He was a barrel-chested black man, a Kathaki warrior who had fled slavery to enter Tertal. Just a bruise, I think, Kel said, gasping for breath. The, the strap, the sergeant, pulled her jacket aside, examining the harness. You took the blow on that? He demanded. I don't feel anything broken. Cal nodded. Stupid, his ego told her. You haven't let anybody land one in months. I don't care how tired you are. Pay attention. If we are done fluttering over the girl, Lord Wilden demanded, walking over. Back to work, lads. Can you use the arm? he asked Kel gruffly. The Emperor's soldiers fight with broken arms, Kel thought, remembering the hard-faced men who defended the Imani court. It isn't broken, just bruised. Really bruised? She nodded, meeting Lord Wilden's gaze squarely. He sighed. Jansen of Erora, pair with Phaleron. Jansen, a third year, obeyed. Mindelin with Prosper of Tamaran. Prosper was a new page. Kel saw what Lord Wilden intended. She could defend herself against Prosper, even with a bad right arm. As Wilden continued to rearrange the pairs, Kel glanced at the fence where he'd been. Jump noticed her look and wagged his tail. Neil saw the dog as they were putting their staffs away. Is that... he asked. Lord Wilden was scratching Jump's spine. Kel nodded. I thought you gave him to Dane, Neil murmured. I did, she replied. They walked to the archery courts with the other pages. Lord Wilden and Sergeant Ezeko brought up the rear, Jump trotting beside them. You know, if he doesn't want to stay, Dane wouldn't make him, Neil whispered. Kel sighed. She did know. The wild major refused to change the nature of Kel's country mount. Contrary mount, Peach Blossom. That's why she said she would try to keep Jump, Kel told Neil gloomily, as they gathered their bows and quivers of arrows, because she thought maybe he wouldn't stay with her. When she looked around halfway through the archery lesson, the dog was nowhere in sight. Kel took heart. Perhaps Jump had realized Kel wouldn't encourage him. Perhaps he's off stealing 
and getting chopped up by that cook, a treacherous voice whispered in her mind. Kel ignored it. She couldn't solve the world's problems. Not yet, at least. Her relief and worry turned to resentment as the boys reached the pages stable for their final morning class. Jump sat by the door, scratching one of his scars. Go away, she muttered as she walked by. Go back to Dane. As she opened the door to Peach Blossom's stall, the dog trotted in ahead of her. His jaunty air suggested that a horse of, of Kell's was a horse of his. Peach Blossom instantly put back his ears, retreated until his rump hit the stable wall, and stamped. Jump sat and regarded the horse. Peach Blossom was a horse to regard with care. He was a small destrier who would have been too big for Kel if he had, was not allowed her, if he had not allowed her to ride him. He was gelded with strawberry rowan markings, reddish brown stockings, face, mane, and tail, and a rusty coat flecked with white. Only three people could handle him without getting bit: Kel, Dane, and the chief hostler Stefan Grimsman. Ignore the dog," she advised the gelding as she stiffly went over him with a brush. He thinks he belongs to me, but he's mistaken. Peach Blossom snorted disbelief, but he'd found the apple Kel had brought, and he did like the brush. He stepped away from the wall. Despite the pain in her shoulder, Kel put the riding saddle on him and mounted up. This week, there'd be no work with the lance and the heavier tilting sandal saddle. The pages would be riding only. The seniors, to show they hadn't gone soft, over the holiday, the first years to show they could manage a horse. It was boring, but as the ache in her shoulder spread, Kel deciding boredom was preferable. At least Jump didn't fall to them out, or if he did, he made sure Kel never saw him. She was able to concentrate on putting Peach Blossom through his paces until the end of morning bell. She returned to the stable and groomed her mount, glad the morning had ended. Phaleron, whose fire chestnut was Peach Blossom's neighbor, leaned on the rail between the stalls. Kel, I'm still not sure about that catapult problem, he confessed, embarrassed. He knew more Tartalan law than any other page, but mathematics came hard for him. If I fetch it to lunch, would you take a look? Kel nodded. You didn't have to ask, you know. Phaleron grinned. Mama raised me polite. In a nearby, nearby stall, Garvey muttered, So, Phaleron, you're friends with her now because you can have her what, whatever you want? Phaleron threw down his brush and went for the other boy. Sore shoulder or no, Kel flew out of the stall. She caught Phaleron just a foot from the sneering Garvey and hung on to him, putting all of her weight into it. The older boy fought her grip. God's curse it, Kel, you heard what he said. I heard a fart, Kel said grimly. You know where those come from. Let it go. Phaleron relaxed, but she still kept both hands wrapped around his arm. He was easy going, but everyone had sore spots. At last, Phaleron made a rude gesture at Garvey and let Kel pull him away. They had almost reached their horses when Neil's unmistakable drawl sounded through the stable. Joran is so pretty. Say, Garvey, are you two friends because you can have him? Garvey roared and charged, but Joran got to Neil first. Before they landed more than a punch each, Neil's friends, including Kel, attacked them. More boys entered the brawl, kicking and hitting blindly, striking friend as often as foe. Kel nearly fainted when someone's boot hit her bruised collarbone. Above the din made by boys and frightened horses, Kel heard the sound of breaking wood. Realizing she would never reach Neil, praying he didn't get his silly head broken, she grabbed Merrick and Seaver by the collar and backed up, dragging them with her. The press of bodies behind her let up suddenly. She nearly fell over backwards. Startled, she looked around and saw Peach Blossom, his teeth firmly sunk into Cleon's jacket. The gelding drew the big youth out of the fray. Prince Rold gripped Owen by both arms to keep him out of the brawl. Rold's horse, the black gelding Shadow, held Phaleron by the arm as he slowly pulled him free. Zaheer's bay shouldered through the mob, stepping on no one but forcing them to move away from him and each other. For a moment a chill ran through Kel. She thought uneasily, The animals here are so strange. Then she shook it off. The Haradan, who trained the ladies of Yamani court to defend themselves, had always said, We use the tools at hand. These animals, uncanny or not, were the right tools for this mess. She thrust Mara Conceiver into a ruined stall and grabbed Cleon's arm. Peach Blossom, can you find Neil? 
she asked her horse. The big gelding released Cleon's jacket, blew scornfully, and waded into the fight. Unlike Zaheer's bay, he was not careful of feet or fingers. If they were in the way, Peach Blossom stepped on them. Several boys rolled clear to nurse bruises and broken bones. You can't let go, Kel, said Cleon, his voice dry. You can let you can let go, Kel, said Cleon, his voice dry. He watched Cavill's heart, Lord Wilden's dark dun mare, who had also broken out of her stall. She dragged Garvey out of the pile. Even I'm not stupid enough to argue with horses, particularly not these horses. Kel glared up at him. Cleon was a fourth year, but he was also a friend. I'm glad you're smart enough to realize that much, she told him. Cleon slapped her cheerfully on the back. What's the matter, Dewdrop? Don't you like men fighting to protect your honor? I can defend my own otter, thank you, she replied. I thought it was Joran's honor at stake. And stop calling me those idiotic nicknames. That joke is dead and rotting. She watched his jump grab Vincent by the ankle, stopping the boy's attempts to kick anyone. Peach Blossom had just seized Neil's jacket, with Neil's shoulder in it, when Lord Wilden, Sergeant Ezeko, and three stable hands entered. They tossed buckets of water they carried on the pages. Silence fell. I want this place straightened up and these horses groomed afresh, Lord Wilden's voice and eyes were like iron. That includes Hart. You will then wash and assemble in the mess hall. I will address you further there. He looked them over, pale with fury. You are a disgrace, the lot of you. He turned on his heel and walked out. Silently, the pages got to work. By the time they reached the mess hall, Lord Wilden had worked out their punishment. It included bread and water suppers for a week, study alone in their rooms at night, no sweets, and no trips out of the palace until midwinter. Those pages who already had Sunday afternoon punishment work were to put that off until the general punishment was done. They were all to help carpenters rebuild the stable. Finally, the training master added two more lead weights to the senior pages' harnesses. The subdued pages went to afternoon classes in nearly complete silence. When it was time to dress for supper, Kel scrambled into her shift and gown, stopping only to demand of Lalassa why Jump hadn't been taken to Dane that morning. When Lalassa, cringing, replied that Gower had carried the dog up the wild mage right after breakfast, Kel shook her head. She would have to deal with Jump later. Still wearing boots and heavy wool stockings under her gown, she went to Neil's room and pounded on his door. He let her in without a word, but protested when she closed the door behind her. Do you want everyone hearing what I have to say? She demanded sharply. If the stump catches you here with the door shut, the stump was Neil's nickname for Lord Wilden. He won't. Kel put her fists on her hips and glared at her friend. You were sixteen last month. You're supposed to know better. Did you honestly think you were helping me down there? He had the strangest look on his face. Are you... Kel, the Amani lump, are you yelling at me? Yes, I am, Kel snapped. You didn't solve anything. You just made it worse. He sat on his bed. Maybe, maybe not. I think they'll reconsider next time they want to start fights over your virtue. Kel blinked at him. What has my virtue to do with anything? I'm surprised they didn't try it last year. Oh, I suppose they made dirty little jokes with each other. Never mind that a real knight is supposed to treat women decently. Maybe they thought saying you're a lump and not as strong and on probation was bad enough. Are you making sense yet? Kel wanted to know. This conversation had taken a very uncomfortable turn. But you're still here. Now they're really worried. They haven't changed their minds about Lady Knight just because Wilden lets you stay. I didn't expect them to, Kel informed him. Well, so they decided to try new insults today. And talk of different kinds of sex makes people crazy. Your point is, she asked. Her mother had explained how babies were made. Nariko had taught the court ladies, including Cal's family, how to preserve their honor from rapists. That didn't seem to be what Neil was talking about. See, Cal, if all of a sudden everyone's getting into fights about your virtue, maybe the stump will get rid of you after all. Neil sighed and finger combed his hair back from his face. Fear trickled down Cal's spine like cold water. Could Lord Wilden change his mind? Who would protest if he did? The king had allowed her to be put on probation in the first place. No doubt if Wilden told her that Kel had to go, the king would agree. 
I'm eleven, she said at last. That's too young to be lying with men, Neil. Much too young. He inspected a bruise on his wrist and touched a fingertip to it. A green spark flashed and the bruise faded. Facts don't matter with Joran and his crowd. Just gossip. Just making your friends angry enough to fight. I reminded them that gossip is a tricky weapon. That's all. It cuts two ways. Kel sighed. I still don't think you did any good. I can take a few insults. You can. I can't. Neil peered out the door. Hall's empty. Shoo. As she walked by, he added, I consider myself chastised. She stopped and turned back. What you said about Garvey and Joran. It's not an insult in, y in Yaman. Some men prefer other men. Some women prefer other women. Kel shrugged. In the eastern lands, people like that pursue their loves privately, replied Neil. M manly fellows like Joran think it's a deadly insult to be accused of wanting another man. That doesn't make sense, Kel said. It's still an insult on this side of the Emerald Ocean, my dear. Now, if I may shave before our bread and water feast? Neil, I, Kel eyed Neil's cheeks and chin. You don't need to. Neil sighed. I live in hope, as the priest said to the princess. If you don't mind, Kel went back to her room, shaking her head. There we go.